So there's stories about John, because everybody has stories about John. Uh, how many people saw him in the lobby from 2003 to 2008, six years in a row? He would come and lead a rhythm section with Danny Grisette and Lorca Hart, and we had a ball. And John would put that bass in his car and drive up overnight and just take a nap and get playing again. He loved to come up here with Carol. But one thing that, that really struck me about John is that he loved his family, he loved his wife, and he loved his daughter, and he loved his grandchildren, my God, and it brought him so much joy. And um, I'm glad. John and I go back 30 years, I guess. And um, last time I remember playing with John, we were working with Ahmad Jamal. And um, we were in New York. I was in the hotel getting off the elevator. And I ran into John. I said, John Hurd. John Hurd. He says, Keys. I said, Right. I said, are you here in the hotel? He said, yes. I said, uh, who are you playing with? He said, I'm with Count Basie. He said, who are you playing with, Calvin? I said, I'm working with Amon Jamal. He said, really? And I said, yes. And as a matter of fact, Amon is looking for a bass player. Would you be interested? He said, oh, my God. And so I took his number and gave it to Amon. And I think... A couple of weeks later, we were working together. Come to find out, him and Ahmad is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, that was just one of the many beautiful experiences that I had with John Hurd. I mean, we all have stories. John Hurd always was a story. You couldn't, you know, meet him and not have a story. But Hi, my name's Warren Vincent. I'm John Hurd's brother-in-law and um, just a little bit about when he uh, his sculptures when he started doing this I was watching him in the studio and um, I was amazed at how he was doing it but um, not only that he told me it's not ready yet and I'm saying what do you mean it's not ready because it seems ready to me but then he said that once it started breathing and start talking, then, then it's ready. So really, so you know, I'm that's a little weird, but that's okay. And what I did was I went inside, came back later that night, snuck in to see if these things are gonna talk. And I heard a lot of noise in the, I said, oh my God. So I ran back in the house and got under the bed. I said, nah, I can't handle this, because but it, it, they were breathing, you know, <laughs> which, which is good. He retired because he still had the ability to play. He just got tired of doing it. <laughs> but um, his wife Carolyn is one of my dearest friends as well, and his daughter Nikki. John, 
it it it, uh, it gives me that much more fortitude and joy to, to live my life in that way. So this is dedicated to John. This is the first time that uh, I guess I've really performed it in such a setting uh, that is so dedicated to John. But every time I play this on, on my gigs, I always start with something and tell the audience about John because I feel like um, in some ways he's a unsung hero and uh, I just try to get people more exposed to John and who he is and what he's about and uh, hopefully this music you'll feel this in this song. So this is called Herd's Word. <laughs> Couldn't say anything nice about the other guys. <laughs> such a quirky guy. We were in the art store buying stuff, right? And there was this gadget to put all your tools in, right? I said, John, I ought to get one of those. You know? I'm like, no, no. He said, don't do that. He said, I said, why? He said, you'll never find what you want. He said, just put it all in a pile. You know it's always in the pile. You don't need to have it. <laughs> well, that was John. playing with Ahmad Jamal the last time, that, that trio, you know, the guys in New York said this is the definition of a jazz trio, those three guys. And it was going great guns and we were all worried John would do something to screw it up. Sure enough, you know, Ahmad being a Muslim and, and Euron being a vegan, they didn't want anything with any pork on it or anything. And they went to dinner one night and they all ordered what they wanted and everything. John ordered the pork chop, that was the end of the trip. <laughs> <laughs> and the bass player after John left, yeah. had an electric bass. And I might said, you take that pork chop home. <laughs> I said, wow, incredible.
My name is Sharon Godbolt, and I am Carolyn Hurd's sister. So that makes John Hurd my brother-in-law. What they feel is so funny is I never call him John. I always call him John Hurd because that's who he is. But I have great memories from John all the way back to when I was a kid. There was this one special Christmas where I got my bicycle and John was there as one of the brother-in-laws to help me put it together. I will never forget that. I've had such great memories of him. And another great thing that John did for me was to teach me how to wash dishes. <laughs> so when I wash dishes, I often think of John. Uh, I am so happy he was in my life. He had a wonderful life. He was so talented. And I'm privileged to have known him. He's such a great man. First of all, John and I met in 1963. We, um, okay, we, uh, my, my friend Barbara and her husband called me and asked me if I wanted to go to a um, jam session in Pittsburgh. And they said that uh, they knew I was a, wow. <laughs> they, they knew I was a big jazz fan. And uh, so they had me come along and they said, and by the way, there's this magnificent bass player who just came in from the Air Force after spending three years in Wiesbaden, Germany. And uh, they did not fix us up. That was, they didn't invite me to fix us up. They knew I loved jazz and they thought it would be a great session. But when we got there, as can happen, there was no jam session that <laughs> night. So, it, serendipitously, if, um, if it had been a jam session, John would have been playing, and I probably would not have had the opportunity to even talk with him. But because he wasn't playing, he sat next to me, and uh, we all talked, and he was funny, and charming <laughs> and handsome and I can't say it was love at first sight but I was a little hooked right from the, <laughs> right from the start and um, that was 59 years ago I guess although I had no thoughts of love at first sight but I was definitely hooked as he was unlike any person I had met before he, I liked his conversation. He talked about music, talked about art and history, and he was being very charming, and I uh, just fell for him. And he was like no man I had ever dated before. And he was, uh, he did not put forth those tired pickup lines <laughs> that was so common at the time. But he changed my life to one that I traveled the world through his stories and th often through by accompanying him. I met interesting, kind people from diverse backgrounds, professions, and views. What of uh, would it, what would it have been to be married to anyone else? John always knew that I had a tendency to get bored easily, <laughs> but thank God, married to him, I was never bored. <laughs> <laughs> what, 
Um, what, um, what, who would have thought that we would have been married for 57 years, share the loveliest of daughters, Nicole, and to be at his side in the end. He had many talents and used them well. I never wanted to be bored and join me certain of that. I miss him dearly. So good to see you. I feel you and I feel Pops here tonight. Do you? I can feel his energy. I can uh, see his spirit, his soul here amongst all of us. I think he's sort of a guiding light over this evening. Um, a lot of blessings lined up to allow us to come here. And um, I just want to thank you all for coming um, near and far to be here to celebrate him. The magic of him, he always talked about um, it's got to dance, right? I know you all heard that. The music has to dance. The art has to dance. And that's who he was. He was the person who wanted to um, find the rhythm of life and make it come alive and have it bring joy, you know? So I hope, you know, all y'all got to experience a little bit of that with him, because I know I got to experience a lifetime of it, and I feel really blessed for that honor, truly. Um, but um, I wanted to let you know, um, my family's here tonight, we came here, um, we're, first of all, I just want to thank you, Jessica. I want to thank you, Lorca and Danny. I know that this was your brainchild. Um, Paul, your space is incredible. Um, such light here. And so, you know, John was, for me, a gift that keeps on giving, really. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the more I look back at kind of what I learned from him and um, playing with him and the experience and just kind of who he was as a person, the, the sincerity um, with, with which he approached music and, and how he played his instrument, and the soulfulness, and just kind of really, you know, who he was as a, as a person and a man and just how he interacted with people and, uh, it, you know, the sincerity he had to go back to that word was just, uh, um, I learned a lot from that, kind of just how honest he was in his music and in his life, and, and that's really a, a, a special, uh, special lesson and a, and a special, uh, um, yeah, just a really a special uh, thing for me to carry on. Um, so we're going to continue on with another tune that uh, that uh, Danny and, and John and I played, and it, it's. Uh, old standard called the Surrey with the fringe on top and John kind of had a, a concept for this tune of, of kind of doing it a, a little differently um, uh, kind of putting some different phrases in it anyway you'll hear it kind of little little quirky and off-center but still really soulful just like John I guess. <laughs> thank you Tribute to John from the Daniel Lipton family. If you've ever been lucky enough to catch a show with John Hurd on bass, you might have noticed a deep, rich humming sound, echoing John's playing in syncopated accompaniment, and wondered if there was really one upright on stage. Henry and Oliver did, anyway, the first of many times they saw John perform one of his playful, searching solos. It turned out that the sound jostling for space with John's bass was actually his voice. John singing along to his own playing, so full of music that it came bursting out of him. John's voice and the voice of his old beat-up bass were only two of the many instruments he had for filling our room with life. Henry and Oliver remember his booming laugh, his warming presence, and the physicality of his spirit. He loved his wife, Carolyn, with an easygoing fierceness that was remarkable to witness. The two of them could spend hours bantering, telling stories, laughing, and they'd soon have everyone around them laughing too. John was always eager to bring out the bass. 
He lived for music. The first time the Lipton family hosted him for Jazz Fest, he quickly asked if he could set up a practice space. He hauled his big, beautiful old stand-up, which he lovingly referred to as the bitch, upstairs. <laughs> but before he started playing, he had just one request. Did Cindy happen to have a super, any super glue? What for, she asked. Well, he said, he had some repairs to do. The bitch was more than 300 years old, and incalculably precious, so Cindy figured John planned to use it to fix some piece of equipment. So she was shocked to learn that John was actually using it to fill a crack in his instrument. John just laughed and shrugged. Yeah, man, he said, one of his constant refrains, practically a musical motif. The bitch and I go way back. John was always excited to share his visual art and spoke often of its importance in his life. During one stay with the Daniel Liptons, he came down from the practice room with a charcoal sketch he had made of, from the view of the window, the tall Italian poplars arrayed, arrayed behind the vineyard, and offered it to Cindy in thanks and tribute. He also gifted the family one of his colorful abstract prints of a bass player, and the Daniel Liptons still treasure both pieces. John was generous with his attention, too. Happy to talk, but e eager to listen. He may have played with Pharaoh Sanders, Oscar Peterson, and Count Basie, but he focused on the moment and made time for everyone. He insisted on it. He wouldn't take no for an answer when he, when he invited Doug to sit in on a song for Jazz Fest 2013's opening night. To prepare, instead of a quick run through of the tune, Thelonious Blue Monk, uh, Thelonious's Blue Monk, Doug recalls that they practiced for almost an hour, John pushing him to keep going, to play with more verve, kicking butt in the most loving and supportive way possible. After surviving a couple runs through the 12-bar blues, Doug was satisfied and ready for dinner. What else is new? John, who traveled from, from LA that morning and must have been exhausted, chuckled his hearty chuckle and said firmly, oh no, you're not gonna get out of this snow uh, that easy. We're doing another. <laughs> Doug was having a blast and couldn't say no, so they added in Keith Jarrett's Lucky Southern and kept it all until John was satisfied. Imagine how hungry Henry, Oliver, and Cindy must have been by the time they came out of that practice room. <laughs> that rehearsal was one of the highlights of Doug's musical life, and playing on stage with John was just as special. His smiling eyes told Doug that it would be all right, and his patient group made sure of it. John made life feel bigger and music sound fuller. He was a public expression of the joyful and lasting power of music. We'll miss him, but we know his voice will continue to sound throughout our lives, rumbling gently in our hearts. With love from Doug, Cindy, Henry, and Oliver. You know, John used to come over about once a week uh, to, my, to my mom's house. Uh, where I had my piano at one point and then, then I moved to someplace else and he would come there and I just thought it was so cool that John Hurd was in my house. You know? <laughs> um, I, I, that's something that I remember a lot. And um, we would just get together and, you know, play tunes, think of arrangements. Um, we didn't always write them down, but it was something of a, of a collective. And John was always so open to try new things. And, but the one thing, as, as Nikki said, was a, kind of a prerequisite for, for anything we did was that it had to have a certain dance to it, you know. And uh, so this first song we're going to play is uh, a song by Red Mitchell, the bassist Red Mitchell. And uh, this is one that he taught Lorca and I by rote. And he said, hey, let, you know, let's, let's play this tune. And he just taught note, note for note. We kind of went through it. And uh, it's called Jam for Your Bread. Thank you. 
John and I bonded in a lot of ways musically, but we also bonded in art because we both work in wax. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that. The majority of designer and I use lost wax casting. So he, these busts of Duke Ellington and, and Mingus, he would carve in wax first. So we would spend a lot of time just talking about wax and waxes and tools. But we love to talk art. And actually, we did that right to the end, you know, just to what, last November or something like that. I came in and he just went right back and talked about the sculpture and what he was going to finish his art. this idea probably about six months ago or something and, and Jessica Felix really came through and ran with it to the ball made this happen as well as Paul Myers just a, a, a huge thank you to them for kind of seeing um, how special this could be and uh, you know, getting behind it, making it happen. And everybody up here, um, you know, Danny, <laughs> making the, the trek across, across the pond and then, and then across this country, um, uh, you know, and, and really making it happen. Um, so appreciative of that, and, and Ralph and Essie. Um, and all of you for really wanting to celebrate John. It just means so much. Um, and of course, John's family, in particular, Carolyn, uh, you know, bringing all the artwork up, and, uh, you know, the labor of love to really share John's creativity and his spirit with, with everybody here and, and with the world. Um, so, and thank you all for making this night so special. I remember about that, John. 
had a way, there, there also seemed to kind of like a bit of a naughtiness uh, <laughs> in there where no. he would find, he would find, no. he would find <laughs> places where you, would, where you would least expect. And uh, that's one of, my, one of my great fond memories uh, because he was always looking for a good chuckle. So uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a song called Hindsight. This was written by Cedar Walton, arranged by us. <laughs> Come in and say, man, I couldn't need her cash and paper tonight. You put his hand over there, and say, nah. Like, you hear me up. Yo, they were there, yo. Yeah, 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 yeah.
gig in LA with Tay Tay Montalou wow. and out to the heat. Wow. 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 So, you know, Tay Tay Montalou is wide, right? Yeah. Bam. Uh, Spain. Yeah. Spain. Spain. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. Killer. Yeah. yeah, I've heard him a lot of times for John. So, the owner of the club comes up and tells John, it's John's gig, right? John her trip. I said, John. I don't like the drummer, no more drum solo. So I said, what? 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 You know, like, what? what? What the hell is it? I don't like the way the drummer play, man. I don't like the way the drummer solo. So I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And Tay Tay Mando can't, he, don't, he can't see anything. He said, John, John, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, no, nothing, nothing, Tay Tay. Get the fuck out of here. Take your shit up. Ah! He left. Wow. He left the game? Oh, okay. And then he told me later the owner, the owner called him back and paid him double money. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That was serious. I mean, oh, that, that's, that's, yeah. yeah, he knows his work. Yeah, yeah that's right, right. Yeah. But John was the kind of cat that I would be with him to something right to go yeah. straight to the chase. Yeah. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't just play right. off of the thing. That's, that's right. right. Am I right? I mean, he would tell you just like you did. You know what I mean? Don't get into a, a conversation about religion with him. Woo-hoo! <laughs> he was deep in the religion, man. He'd be ready to go. Toe to toe against you about okay. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. when he worked on his sculpt on his clay yeah. things thing he could take the pictures of it put it picture there trying oh, man, I gotta get that chin right something <laughs> you know right nigga right oh, yeah. he's like I didn't get that right man I gotta get that right he'd be in there we in there for hours we'd be playing he'd be playing the music be hanging out with him he's like I gotta get the chin right bro. I gotta get it right <laughs> motherfuckers beat my ass <laughs> People like it, prefer to either keep taking pictures of it, seeing the angle there, you know. So yeah. it was pretty, it was pretty, he was a, he was a hell of an artist. Yeah. All the cats I know in New York that know him, he said one time he was in New York, I think, uh, uh, George, uh, Cole Nolan was playing, and the bass player was in there, right? So he, they came back to the set, and the bass player, and John started playing, and so he started picking the bass player, and George comes to bass player. And then pretty soon, John started playing. And then John was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> again for Danny Grissett.
you know, that I just can't imagine kind of getting a, a, a better group of guys up here to celebrate John. Um, just being able to reconnect with Danny after about seven years, uh, you know, John made that happen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, um, it, was, it was just such a special connection that the trio had and kind of revisiting that music um, and then kind of adding Ralph and having Essie here to kind of really, really uh, bring, bring these tunes back to life. Um, having a blast. Thank you. Really special. So, and uh, again, so so happy that you are all here to celebrate John and to kind of celebrate with us. Um, and so, we're going to continue on. Uh, we're going to kind of, uh, you know, John really loved Latin music and Brazilian music. I mean, really everything. <laughs> but uh, we're going to touch on, on one side of, of what John loved and we're gonna do a um, we're gonna do a Antonio Carlos Joe Beam tune a bossa and uh, this one's entitled Triste.